start. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending this session, uh, which is called uh, uh, Private uh, Equity Investments. We shall go away a little bit from the uh, schedule. The original plan was to have extended presentations, but the participants and panelists uh, suggested that we have a more interactive uh, Q&A format. The attractiveness of the CE region, these countries in 2008 and 9 went through uh, unexpected drop and fall in the uh, uh, interest of investors, almost uh, it went out almost twice as much. And uh, now investors are coming back gradually. Russia is uh, so far leading, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, motivated by the interest in the oil and gas uh, uh, mineral extraction sector. And again, there's an uneven uh, comeback. Mm, varies depending upon the geographical location of a country and economic economy of the country and local decisions of local governments and they might be quite exotic decisions one million lives uh, to give bulgarian uh, citizenship nationality to everyone who invests uh, one million lives or two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for residence permanent in hungary or uh, tax amnesty being discussed by the Russian uh, government. How effective can these measures be? And how far uh, this uh, fight for investors and investment can take us? And who can become a leader? How these uh, ratings uh, may change and vary over time? I suggest that Alexander Pereshenko uh, get started. Alexander. I may mistake, be mistaken, Director of Partners Network of Agency of Strategic Initiative. The question is what measures are being taken by the Russian government and how effective are these measures to improve the investment climate in Russia? Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. One year ago, on the instruction of the President, we launched a national entrepreneurial initiative to improve the investment climate, which is a set of roadmaps aimed at improvement of the investment climate in specific areas. The, uh, we started with the um, customs administration obtaining uh, construction permanent uh, electricity hookups. Uh, uh, the government has approved seven roadmaps aimed, uh, among other things, at improvement of Russia's ratings in doing business. As a significant indicator uh, enabling one to compare uh, countries. And with regard to, and these roadmaps uh, actually have been developed by uh, businesses uh, using the agency as a platform. It's not our uh, position, but the position of the business community. If we talk about the customs, the businesses involved in foreign trade, if it's our, uh, electricity connections, these are consumers and power supply companies. So it's kind of vox populi, voice of the people. And uh, it's good that uh, the government has approved, uh, has included in the agenda to approve those roadmaps virtually without any modifications. And now we are monitoring, together with the businesses, uh, the implementation of these roadmaps. We are very positive about those and um, this work, uh, supported by another project of ours, which is no longer just uh, the Agency of Strategic Initiative project, but the federal project. Uh, called a regional investment standard. It's a set of practices or requirements to be met by regional in, uh, authorities uh, in their engagement with investors. Which is a, 
uh, actually based on successful experience of regional regions in terms of attracting investment. And there are secrets, despite the overall trend of uh, uh, investment going down, there are regions which are quite spectacular. Uh, together with the Business Russia Association, we looked as an agency at what makes these the regions different. Uh, Kaluga, Lipetsk, Tatarstan, Belgrade. Despite some not very positive discussions on the prospects of attracting investment into Russia, there are some regions which have uh, quite impressive results, performance. And the outcome of our analysis of these successful regions provided the 15 points or items what regional authorities should accomplish for investors to have a positive view about what regions are doing. Despite the fact that we have a big differentiation between regions in terms of climate, size, economies, there are donor regions, there are recipient uh, regions. Still, there is a set of basic measures, standard measures, improving the investment climate in the specific regions. And we believe uh, it is something that is working. What is a regional standard? An investor should have a clear understanding of the direction of the development of these regions' infrastructure and where the investor can plan a factory site where you as a region uh, are uh, going to have electricity and grid uh, networks. And investors should have this information in a clear form. They should have a direct access to uh, the regional authorities. There should be an investment council discussing implementation of investment projects in the region. These are systemic basic things which provides a format for regional authorities in their interaction with investors. Uh, uh, that's uh, as far as the investment climate is concerned. But investment will not come as much as we want them to be if we are not proactive in attracting investors, not just improving our investment climate uh, federal and regionally, but proactive uh, att 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 attraction and promotion. And uh, the next step that some regions have uh, uh, taken and made, which should be done federally, is having a team of people uh, that will be active in uh, attracting investment. In Tatarstan a year ago, they set up an agency to attract foreign investment. Good results. Uh, per one dollar spent on attracting investment into the Republic of Tatarstan, they have raised $500 of investment. Quite good ratio. If you look at other countries, on the average, $1 spent on attracting, active attracting investors, covering Africa and other countries, 198, the global indicator, uh, 500 in Tatarstan. <coughs> Again, there's a low starting point, but such cases as Kaluga, Tatarstan, Belgrade, Tambov uh, tells us something about the great potential of uh, the Russian regions if the authorities are doing uh, the right thing. The forecasted investment to go down, uh, these uh, projections are becoming lower. This was a discussion point. After accession to WTO, the inflow of investment will go down or will go up. There were different estimates. What actually are we having? The overall trend worldwide is foreign investment going down uh, in a considerable way. That's an uh, implication and consequence of a crisis. The crisis, now we see a kind of recovery. Anyway, in competition for foreign investors between countries, emerging economies particularly, would only grow. And in this area, unless other uh, takes a very active and proactive and professional standpoint in this area, our projections and predictions may not be positive. But look at Kaluga. It used to be a depressive <coughs> region. It has become a leader, thanks to two decisions 
taken by the regional authorities. One, total transparency of authorities, no corruption in inter-engagement and in interaction with investments, and a professional team of administrators that are geared to um, one solution, one decision. Uh, professionally prepared sites. No exotic things uh, uh, which may be uh, done by our colleagues in uh, Central Eastern Europe to attract investors. Russian reasons uh, don't have to do that. Russia is an attractive country because uh, of the size of its domestic market particularly. Thank you, Alexander. I invite uh, our panelists to join in. Maybe Russian speakers might uh, uh, tell us whether you agree with the assessment expressed on this uh, uh, state of the status quo and the measures being taken. Make it transparent and you have the investment coming in. I think that this potential competition between regions, this benchmarking that we discussed with Alexander a long time ago, uh, with regard to distribution networks and electricity grids. It may work uh, with regard to regions. The agency of investment development that uh, Alexander mentioned, the uh, Republic of Tatarstan, it's unique uh, not only because it's the only one in Russia's regions, but there's no such agency at the federal level either, uh, which tells me that in that specific republic, uh, people are creative and uh, they are outcome, result oriented. They are thinking uh, how to attract investment. They are looking around. Uh, across the world, emulating what works. The mechanism of competition has been invented uh, uh, not recently, but long ago, and if, when everything is more or less transparent, it works. I think the case of Kaloga, uh, Tatarstan, and other regions that Alexander mentioned may help to launch this uh, mechanism of competition between the regions. Uh, in terms of uh, attraction of investment, also in terms of the quality of administration uh, regionally, and uh, potentially that's a pretty uh, powerful driver for the national development through regional development. What can impede in your view? Uh, do regional authorities have enough powers to boldly enter into this uh, competition? Essentially, there's a uh quite enough. Maybe some things are missing, but uh, there's still quite enough for development. If we uh, look at uh, the area of our interest, municipal infrastructure, which is far from perfect in this country, if a region is willing, they can offer a civilized conditions uh, for a private investor to enter this market. I can offer concession terms. A region could do it uh, in an advanced fashion, in line with the uh, best international practices. Infrastructure is like the foundation. Uh, in what state uh, do you think it is in different parts of the country and uh, how much it impacts the competitive level of different regions as they struggle for investment? Well, the state is quite pathetic and uh, there are colossal opportunities in terms of uh, direct investment in many parts of the country. Uh, people still live in stone age. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, they have uh, DC uh, pumps, which is uh, something that people in the rest of the world have well forgotten uh, 30 years ago. On the one hand, uh, like I said, it's pathetic. On the other hand, it uh, offers uh, huge opportunities for improvements. 
in this industry. But that again uh, should be based on the willingness in the regions uh, to uh, give private capital an opportunity to enter this sector and uh, make its contribution. Can you describe a uh, private equity investor's interest in this sphere of infrastructure? While we're talking about infrastructure projects in Russia, we see uh, contradicting interests between different investors, and they usually refer to a lack of understanding uh, of a mechanism which they can use to return their investment. The mechanism is there, uh, but only to a degree. Well, we have uh, Ilya Springer. He has uh, his interests. I have my interests. There's uh, this Alpha company, Rosvoda Canal. Uh, all these people are uh, active in their own way, uh, but they are not moving fast. Uh, regional administrations, regional uh, authorities, uh, are not very willing to support uh, businesses. Uh, from short history of investment activity, we know how uh, at locations they address infrastructure challenges. Uh, remember the uh, governor of Kaluga region uh, who gave his phone number uh, to foreign investors so that they could call him up and uh, address uh, problems associated with availability uh, of uh, utilities uh, essential for that business. Is that the kind of interest that you are lacking? We would like to have more systemic approach. Uh, a mobile number of the governor is great, but we would like to uh, see structures like the one Alexander has mentioned, an agency uh, for institutional development of uh, Tatarstan. They have a team and every member of that team has a phone number that we can call up and uh, we could resolve issues as they appear. We would like to have a more systemic approach. Ilya, uh, Marina, uh, can you follow up on this, please? Uh, now that we are talking about power generation, uh, if we look at uh, traded companies, their performance is quite pathetic. Raw uh, shares are uh, two times cheaper than they were before the restructuring, despite all the efforts. Electrical grids, uh, that is the favorite type of companies for many. They're traded at a 0 0.4 enterprise value uh, to base. The privatization uh, that uh, we've been promised uh, in this industry uh, for a long time, it doesn't look like it is really going to happen. So I can say that we uh, don't see sufficient rules uh, of engagement. Uh, we don't have a clear, transparent regulation. So what keeps you interested uh, in this uh, market segment? Everything is bad. Everything is pathetic. Well, the assets are inexpensive. However, if nothing happens, uh, they can remain inexpensive forever. Uh, if we look at the regions, I can agree with what's been said about Tatarstan. They are nice to work with. A year ago, we uh, launched a uh, fund together, and uh, it was done quite successfully. Uh, we attract uh, European companies uh, which are willing to invest uh, in new technologies in Tatarstan, uh, usually sustainable technologies, uh, of which we don't have that many in Russia. Uh, you have an opportunity to uh, tell us about what you do. I uh, can add a uh, spoonful of tar uh, to this uh, barrel of honey. We've uh, compared Russia to Turkey. Why did you compare Russia to Turkey? I'm going to tell you. Uh, Turkey is more pro-Western. They are looking to join the uh, European Union, and they're still an Eastern country. Well, uh, yeah, how they uh, trade shares. 
we looked at the way uh, we looked at the present value of future GDP uh, for Turkish market and uh, for Russian market. So we uh, decided to see uh, what a uh, Russian market could be worth uh, if we had uh, the same indices uh, as in Turkey. And uh, it turned out that uh, Russia is losing about $240,000 uh, of value per capita, uh, quite a significant amount. Uh, why this is happening? Uh, because we have uh, problems with the rule of law, with uh, institutions, with the level of uh, modernization. There's uh, not sufficient institutional reforms in the country. That said, that said, um, who did you present this uh, study to? Uh, and where are you going to go from there? We need to see the development of institutions. We need more democracy. Who is going to uh, see uh, the results of your study in the government? Uh, the Agency for Strategic Initiatives, uh, they would probably be willing to look at this. Uh, what we hear from the government is that uh, things are even worse uh, in the European Union. Uh, they're in the middle of the crisis. Why should we move in the same direction? Uh, you should look at different sides uh, of every uh, problem. Uh, let's now pass the floor to Kamil Blazek. Kamil, uh, are things really worse in the European Union? Uh, what do you think? And uh, what can you tell us about the situation in Czech Republic? Uh, we really want to know. Uh, you have uh, many uh, challenges in front of you, modernization of energy generation uh, industry. And of course, everybody is uh, wondering about the uh, growth of uh, real estate uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, that's uh, quite an interesting thing. So what's going on with the investment? What do you think? So, uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, I think this is a quite a broad uh, scope of, of, of issues uh, you have asked, and uh, well, I would uh, I, I wouldn't like to to say that actually eurozone is right now uh, on the top of its. Uh, um, uh, of its success, it is uh, certainly not. Uh, but I mean, the presentation itself, and actually what I have uh, been through when preparing the presentation was uh, a bit about the developments on the M&A market in the CEE, and mainly like the Central and Eastern Europe, uh, plus Russia and Southeastern Europe, including including Turkey, over the past two years, uh, to see what were the trends uh, and what were the uh, and what were the uh, what we possibly can expect this year. <coughs> And comparing this also with the Czech, uh, with the Czech, uh, uh, with the Czech Republic, as an example uh, and selection. So, uh, I will not go through all the statistics. Uh, possibly, it will be available on online. I hope so. Uh, and I think the numbers are well known. Uh, what I would like to point out is that I think that the that the CE market is uh, is not one market. I think what we what we all see is that there are discrepancies between each jurisdictions and also a different uh, level of interest in particular sectors if you go country by country. Now, uh, what uh, I would say in terms of uh, uh, the trend, uh, the trend what we have seen overall was obviously decreasing number of transactions and, decrease, and slightly decreasing value of uh, the total value of transactions. I think that this will continue uh, during 2013 as well. Uh, if we look on the sectors which were on the top, uh, obviously in the total number, uh, in the total numbers, you you would say that the, the usual suspects being uh, energy and infrastructure and mining as, as one group, uh, obviously with with the transactions on the Russian market leading mm -hmm. uh, in terms of value and, <coughs> uh, but 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 also very significant transactions in infrastructure in Central Europe right now. For example, if we talk about the Czech Republic, the Czech gas, uh, the, the Czech gas transmission grid has been uh, uh, has been sold uh, uh, to an uh, to an to an investor. 
Uh, very interesting uh, sector is FMCG, generally the consumer related uh, markets, pharmaceuticals and uh, new technologies and, uh, and IT. Now, if I would go country by country, uh, I think that uh, what we see is that uh, Russia, Turkey, Poland and to some extent Czech Republic are the countries which, uh, which uh, will continue to, to be uh, interesting and will, will attract investors' interest. And now I talk about the M&A investments uh, uh, rather than uh, foreign direct investments. Because I think there is, there is a, a sort of a line to be, to be drawn between those, those two groups of investments. Uh, in terms of uh, sectors, uh, I think all the names which I said will, will, will continue uh, to, be, to be attractive. Possibly energy and infrastructure being even more attractive in, uh, in the Eastern European countries. Uh, because of the well, not so well developing uh, general EU energy policy. If you look on the recent changes in the emission trading schemes uh, or uh, the prices for emission allowances which are expected, I think that will just lead to each country developing their own uh, energy infrastructure policy and uh, that will possibly lead to, to more investments from, from uh, uh, from both the governments and international investors. Uh, one sector which I would add, and you mentioned that was real estate. I think uh, despite the general decrease in some real estate investments, uh, in particular Polish and Czech market in Central Europe uh, will, uh, will be attractive and will continue to be attractive, uh, both in office, retail and residential. Uh, and uh, well, I don't know enough about Russian real estate to comment on it. One last point which I would like to make and which was quite surprising, uh, positively surprising to me was uh, uh, being from a Czech Republic was a ranking by Bloomberg which has been recently published on the most attractive emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, the ranking, if, if, you go, uh, if, you, if you go on the CE countries, was actually that the Czech Republic was number five as the most attractive from Eastern Europe, with Turkey number seven and Russia number nine, following Poland 12 and Hungary 18. Uh, and uh, I see this as actually as a positive sign because I'm very happy to be emerging market uh, and not part of Western Europe in those days. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, thank you, thank you. Interest uh, to infrastructure projects is to be found in uh, all parts of Europe. Ilya, over to you. Um, what do you have to tell us? I think uh, we would like to have a good discussion. I can. Uh, follow up on the uh, infrastructure investments. Uh, we've been investing uh, in energy generation and uh, power utilities since 2003. In terms of direct projects, we think that this is uh, very interesting and very attractive. Why so? Uh, can you show uh, slide six in my presentation? There's uh, lots and lots of inefficiency uh, in this segment. If you look at a boiler, uh, if you travel 50 uh, kilometers outside of Matru, Moscow, uh, there's uh, lots and lots of old, outdated equipment. Uh, if you replace this equipment uh, with modern uh, boilers, uh, you can uh, very significantly raise efficiency. Uh, there's very little uh, statistics available uh, regarding uh, city utilities. Uh, losses are comparable to 30 uh, percent. In, in Western Europe uh, we're looking at uh, 8 to 12 percent. Water losses are also twice higher uh, than what they see in the West. So if you invest you can get very high efficiency, very high return. Uh, thanks to what the government did, the tariffs are now uh, quite sufficient. Uh, so uh, low tariffs are no longer a problem, uh, but there is still very little investment uh, in main assets. Uh, companies uh, do not invest uh, their profits. Uh, so people uh, spend more and more uh, for utilities and uh, they're just not getting better. We uh, work in this direction. Uh, a uh, 
break even period for a new uh, boiler is uh, around five years, uh, which isn't bad. Uh, one doesn't have to do anything about tariffs. Uh, tariffs keep growing. Uh, like they do for a neighbor company, uh, which doesn't do anything. That's what makes utilities uh, attractive. There's a huge uh, space for improvements. Uh, utility companies are controlled by people who have a little idea about profitability and economics. Uh, they only know uh, about the technical side of their business. They know how to support their cities uh, in winter how to keep them warm, uh, which is nice, but it's not sufficient, and it's difficult to find a good, competent, uh, skilled uh, economist uh, for those companies. Uh, look at the field of uh, distributed generation. Tariffs are so high these days that uh, this uh, field is quite attractive uh, for private investors. If you have a good heat load, then you can create a, a very efficient uh, and a very effective company. Uh, this chart uh, shows uh, the uh, efficiency uh, in uh, power plants. Uh, the payback time uh, in such a project uh, would amount to six to seven years. Uh, this brings up the question, uh, how should regions uh, act uh, to uh, look more attractive to investors? They don't do anything. Uh, in some areas, uh, they try to uh, build roadmaps, uh, planning uh, for greater level of uh, attractiveness. Uh, investors are not cash cows. They uh, come to make money. Uh, and this has to be understood. An investor is an important resource uh, which needs to uh, get all the necessary support. There are different attitudes that we see in different parts of the country uh, to investors. Uh, in uh, some parts of the country, investors see hostility. Uh, uh, in the first year, an investor uh, is attracted when uh, it spends the money. Uh, the local uh, players are trying to make uh, that investor feel most unwelcome, so that the investor would leave uh, the area and leave the investment on the table. Uh, uh, that uh, is a big problem. Uh, public uh, servants should uh, change their attitude. Uh, they should understand the real role of an investor. We see that in different parts of the country quite a bit. Despite the overall negative atmosphere uh, that we see in power generation and in uh, utilities, uh, there's been some uh, positive changes, positive for investors. If you look at power generation, if you compare the picture uh, to what we saw in 2006, profitability grew twofold in absolute terms. Uh, the uh, uh, income has grown, uh, the revenues have grown. Um, Capitalization is linked to investor expectations, uh, which is impacted uh, by statements made by uh, public authorities. Well, if you go uh, to a good region with a good governor, uh, what can you guarantee? What if tomorrow you are going to have a new governor who would be uh, bad for you? Well, uh, we are looking at high-risk uh, profits. Uh, there are no guarantees, risks are high, uh, so investors are asking for a high premium. Uh, we've been uh, doing this since uh, 2004. Governors uh, do not change much. Uh, mayors don't change much either. On a serious note, I can tell you, there's this uh, program uh, approved by the government uh, to uh, attract investments in uh, city utilities. Uh, this program is now being implemented. Uh, although there's uh, 
a lot of opposition to it, uh, but the program still works. Uh, measures are taken and uh, uh, we as investors uh, feel positive uh, effects of this program. In the industries in which uh, we specialize, the situation is such that uh, we just want to tell uh, the local people that they should uh, leave it alone and uh, let it run. Uh, they have some difficult uh, problems to resolve uh, in TGK. Uh, the investment environment isn't uh, great, risks are high, uh, but the profitability is high. In TGK, uh, we invested uh, into this one uh, company. It doesn't have a good managerial team. Uh, Sergey can tell you, in Russia, there's uh, two big utility uh, projects, uh, RKS and the other one. They have their uh, own challenges, but uh, that's it. Uh, so for the people uh, who know how to handle this, uh, the profitability is good, but the risks are there. Uh, how can you identify the quality of an investor? Uh, and the scale at which they are willing to invest. We know uh, about big Western companies which invested in uh, power generation and their profitability is quite okay uh, compared to local investors. Uh, in uh, city utilities, uh, who is interested? Ross for the canal uh, is who you mentioned. If you look at them, uh, first, the government uh, wanted to uh, attract investors uh, to energy generation. Uh, they uh, came up with the idea of uh, capacity uh, supply mechanisms. Uh, city utilities since Soviet time have been uh, lagging behind uh, the uh, power generation sector. Uh, they had uh, worse uh, technology, uh, worse facilities greater level of uh, depreciation uh, of main assets. I have not heard of many Western investors uh, who would uh, be interested uh, in uh, working in this uh, sector. They're trying to do business uh, in the traditional way. Uh, they want to have a clear picture uh, of making a return on their investment. The industry has to be prepared for that. Uh, in um, Power generation, uh, Chubais has uh, done a lot of preparation uh, work. Uh, he prepared the scene for arrival of Western investors. Uh, so what are the prospects in power generation? I have heard uh, they are talking about DPM2. In one way or another, they uh, plan to uh, provide uh, guarantees. Uh, well, now we see that there is a conflict uh, with the uh, industry. We uh, can say that the conflict with the industry uh, is in the uh, greed's domain, uh, and uh, that's what we should address. That's where the government has control. Uh, it's time that uh, some grids should be privatized. Well, I've heard that uh, the government is uh, willing to uh, have that happen. If you have a good technology chain, if you have a good load uh, for a uh, power plant, it will uh, pay back for itself uh, within uh, seven years. But it has to be set up right, and you have to have good buyers. And uh, that is where TGKs have a problem. Is there anything that you have to add to this? It's been my uh, impression that the discussion about the uh, risk premium was uh, quite an interesting one uh, when compared the situation to Turkey. Ilya said that uh, the uh, profitability could be high uh, for the people who will have the courage uh, to try their luck and invest in city utilities. I uh, see uh, somewhat of a contradiction there. Uh, one of the main problems uh, that we uh, have in Russia is uh, high cost of funds. 
uh, and uh, that is uh, rooted in uh, high risks. Uh, people are uh, getting Russian level of profitability uh, close to 20 percent. Uh, what we do, uh, we do because we hope we can get our 20 percent uh, or maybe even more. Uh, which is certainly way, way better than 10%, uh, but we do not uh, carry all Russian risks. Ideally, we would like to uh, see Russia at the level of Turkey in terms of risks. Uh, we could be making less, but uh, then again, we would have a more civilized level of risk. But that's not where we are. I uh, see that in the last couple of years, uh, the situation has been uh, deteriorating. Uh, and uh, I hope that this is a temporary thing, which will change over time. And uh, maybe Karina uh, can uh, give us something positive. Catalina Kohlmeier. Uh, head of uh, VTB Capital uh, Investment in Central and Eastern Europe. It should be working. I have a, a short presentation in which I would like to address uh, Russian investment uh, to uh, Central Europe and uh, Central European investment to Russia. My team at VTB Capital works with uh, customers in Central and Eastern Europe. The first step is the work that we do with Russian customers of VTB. They are looking at uh, Eastern Europe, looking for investment opportunities. Can you put up slide three in my presentation, please? I will agree with Kamil, who said that uh, one cannot uh, view uh, CE as uh, one single country or as one single region. Although in terms of size and in terms of its population, these are all former uh, communist countries. Uh, and besides Russia and CIS, we include the Baltic republics as well. That's our definition. And although, in terms of population, there are 120 million people, uh, overall they are similar to Russia in terms of their economies, but uh, each uh, market is uh, individual. There are countries with uh, good credit uh, development, like Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, or Slovakia. There are countries with uh, uh, lending not well as developed, but uh, the rate of return is higher, like Serbia, B Bulgaria. When I should always know why the investors are uh, coming to those countries, what uh, risk the investor is willing to assume, and uh, what return is important to, to have. Well, this slide shows investment flows between uh, Russia and CE, and uh, the major uh, conclusion is that the flows are pretty low. If you look at MAA, uh, M&A flows, if you one looks at investment into Russia or uh, Central Eastern Europe, the, it's not big size, but the deals are there, and there's a growing interests on both sides. Interestingly, those who are uh, from Russia, these are uh, resource companies, oil companies, or power companies looking at uh, the sea, and they are investing into countries where political relations are good with Russia. Uh, the biggest investment was uh, to Hungary, Bulgaria, a Czech Republic, where there are no big political problems uh, concerning the Russian investor coming in. At the same time, uh, the CE investors are looking at Russian targets, and there are investors, retail uh, companies in uh, CE, 
who, who want to focus on the uh, consumer base, uh, not companies as big as Coca-Cola, for instance. How can Russian investors uh, come into uh, CE countries? Now time has changed and many investors uh, to CE are leaving. Not that uh, the situation is bad, it's because very much is because of their internal problems. They have a uh, big uh, capital burden, uh, load, um, and the regulation Again, one should look at countries on an individual basis, but still there is some uh, regulatory system in the infrastructure which has been in operation for several years and provides uh, with some uh, companies, investors with some expected return. It becomes more predictable and the investment is not uh, much risk risky, highly risky. We looked at some big deals uh, uh, which took place this year and last year uh, from 200 million to 3.5 billion. Eon left uh, RV, Suez left. And this is uh, investment is not about privatization, it's private companies selling those private companies. And we see more and more such uh, possibilities in the market. Another example is, again, the size is uh, smaller, but uh, maybe uh, easier for Russians to handle because the size of the capital needed is not as big. We see many Russian companies are looking at industrials for investment equipment producing uh, companies, manufacturing companies. Normally these are uh, small size uh, private deals where private uh, which can be well organized. There are no big political uh, implications or influences. And our job is to find and connect and link the buyers and sellers. And we see many uh, opportunities for Russian investment in CE. One should uh, there's a more positive attitude to Russian investors in CE. And uh, uh, when we discuss the mandate, they tell us, "Find me a Russian investor." So much for how we see the attractiveness of the CEA region for outside investors. One interesting aspect, going back to the infrastructure, quite often and justifiably, investors are criticizing Russia. But if one looks at the electricity sector, if you look at the most difficult regions in, for electricity companies, not in Russia, Hungary is the most difficult country. What is going there is uh, um, a total, uh, uh, even Western companies call it expropriation and so even stronger words are used. And there's a 10% uh, on windfall profits and the requirement of the government to reduce the tariffs unjustifiably. It never happened in Russia. I'm not saying it's good, but sometimes people forget and but they say, oh, Russia is so bad. No, it's so much worse in Hungary. I will agree with this. One should look uh, at each country individually. Hungary it used to be a good country for investment, but now 
the government's policy is such you cannot um, argue with them. And not only the power sector. The country is uh, not in good shape and uh, therefore is, uh, taxes and constraints and limitations imposed on the entire uh, economy. It's not only specific to power sector. One should be very careful with Bulgaria. And Bulgaria is a good country for uh, investment. Uh, the TB Capital uh, arranged two deals there, had two deals there, but the Bulgarian government started negotiations with foreign investors in, uh, through the press. And one should look at regulation and political connection. Russia, because of the size of the country, the small, smaller countries will not uh, attract attention. Russia is a member of the BRIC, and those countries are smaller. I remember uh, Asia Pacific summit, and where we discussed possibilities for investment in uh, Eastern Asia. And Russia is an investor is not uh, seen as such. There's no big famous public company that would make big investment overseas. And they're skeptical about our possibility to be contractors in the infrastructure projects, except perhaps uh, uh, atomic nuclear power plant construction. The issue that you raised, the matter that you raised, is quite interesting. In what sectors? People are expecting Russian investors. And may I add, no, we know uh, uh, steel makers. There are ca other cases. The, the uh, developing company would buy a developed company with uh, big multipliers, and, um, and there would be a payback. One should look at synergy and uh, what can they achieve uh, by through that investment and how they will manage. Uh, so that it should not be a passive investment, but they should, how they will integrate uh, this uh, acquired company into their existing business. There are investments which did not succeed, but there are successful investment cases. Gazprom Neft is well operating in Serbia. And their company in Serbia is um, also railways. No, not yet. Yeah, like you said, where are they expected? Uh, railways is infrastructure. Infrastructure is al always a political issue. Uh, to sell it so that everybody can have access to the infrastructure. And this infrastructure, and then, uh, the, the private sector where Russian company could show their know-how and their leading role, the steel makers, yeah, they're welcome. And the company was bought in Czech Republic eight years ago, and they won against a uh, home local company. We can ask Kamel where are Russian investors, investors expected? I agree with Catherine that one should look at the synergy on a specific business. Uh, construction in the Czech Republic where Gazprom Bank uh, made the deal and that uh, increases the chances for Rosatom to be awarded a contract. Uh, they have a local uh, plant and, and they can they use that experience for other sites. 
канал. One thing about the trends I missed and how they changed. What we could see in the presentation of VTB. The Russian investors during the past three to four years they have established in themselves in Central Eastern Europe countries and they are better accepted. And again, this investment was strategic investment by big uh, company groups and well presented. I think that the Russian investors has have not uh, succeeded. It's a kind of a PR campaign. And I, the situation has improved. Uh, if we look at Sberbank and the acquisition of the Volksbank and how it is presented, and this allows uh, for new investments in Central Eastern Europe. And we will see within you know, five to four years that it will have a positive impact. For other groups, we will also see a growing interest for ECCE is the Chinese investors. Uh, they are interested in infrastructure, in construction projects. And they come not only such uh, Serbia, Greeks, or Turkey, but also Poland, the Czech Republic, uh, mm, Slovakia, and Hungary. There are companies from the Middle East investing in real estate. Uh, some of the uh, biggest investments are into real estate and, and even regional companies. In Catherine's presentation, there was PPF or Katsage or other groups. One can see that those groups have become pretty strong uh, regionally. In your view, is the attitude toward Russian investors changing? Is there still prejudice against uh, uh, Russian investors? You recall the Sberbank's acquisition? But some years before, Sberbank was trying to purchase Opel, and it, they did not succeed. I think we've seen a positive change. It's not only prejudice against the Sbir Bank, but also on the part of the banking regulator. Yeah, it's a thing of the past. Yeah, ten years ago in the Czech Republic, this would not be easy or perceived in terms of economic development. Uh, Hungary five years ago the situation was different. Uh, today the Hungarian government would say openly they would have Rosatom as their number one as the, their company of choice. I want Mr. Thompson to join in on the discussion. Arthur Thompson representing CFA uh, Council of Governors, Board of Governors. Part of your presentation is about South Africa. It's like uh, you're a competitor or for us to have a benchmark to compare. Investment in South Africa is what we see as uh, active growth. But Africa and what I would just like to do is give you a bit of an idea. Uh, if you'll go to slide six, please. 
if you will. I'd just like you to slide number six, please. Thank you. If you would just like to think about what a global investor really wants and what a global investor is looking for. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm going to jump up and I'll tear myself to pieces here. Okay. I'd just like to propose something that you might find rather strange, is that you should think of a country as a discounted cash flow. You know, we always look at investments in terms of discounted cash flow, but maybe think about a country like that as a change. If you're going to go and use a discounted cash flow in a country, then you need trust, predictability, stability and opportunity, obviously. Now, just listening to today's discussions, it appears that a number of these things are missing. You've got to have all those things in brackets over there, that's the macro, the institutional, the fiscal, the social political factors in place. And obviously government has an important part to play. For long-term investment, particularly for fixed investment, you need faith and you need trust in the system. Now if you haven't got this, you won't have the right numbers that you can put into this DCF of yours and you won't be able to forecast out for a very long-term time horizon. In other words, as an investor you will be demanding a short time horizon, in other words, a very high hurdle rate before you invest. So I think those are all very important factors that all the CE countries that we've been talking about need to think about and to look and to create an environment where global investors are prepared to put their money. Then I thought it would just be interesting if we could just look at Africa for a moment. As you know, there's been a lot of publicity about Africa and how Africa is rising at the moment and this is one of the hot areas of investment. It's certainly been the flavour, not just at the moment, but say over the last 10 years. And there doesn't seem to be much reason why this shouldn't continue. That very fuzzy picture is of the BRICS over there. As you know, South Africa is a small S in the BRICS. Quite how the whole BRICS hangs together other than it's a very convenient term and why South Africa is there is also quite debatable. This is a map that you probably can't see too well, but if I can just run you through some of it. Africa is a continent which is as long from north to south as what Russia is wide from St. Petersburg to Valdivostok. But there are 54 countries in Africa, and if we talk about sub-Saharan Africa, in other words, below the big desert there, there are then some 49 countries. Every country is unique, and within that there are various unique aspects to it. But I just tried to express in the wrong colours in that bottom bar over there, but starting from the dark brown and going through to the light brown, the growth rates that, be, that investors are able to see in Africa. We've got those countries in the very dark brown, and I've mentioned them there, Ghana, Nigeria, Botswana, that are growing at very high rates. They're growing between 7 and 10%. And in fact, Af South Africa, which is right at the bottom, which is currently about a quarter of the continent's GDP, is holding the continent back, if you like. It's growing at around about between 2 and 3% per annum on a longer term. Capacity is probably around about 4%. Now, these are regimes that vary from dictatorships through to democracies, but there are enough countries that have got a vast amount of minerals over there that are making investors welcome. And in particular, the Chinese have been, make, have been coming in and have got a lot of publicity. They're looking for the resources, the minerals, they're looking for food. They're also looking for markets that they're going to sell their manufactured goods to. And they're putting in infrastructure where there was none before. Plus there's been another revolution. There's been a revolution of mobile phones, which has allowed mobile banking and it's allowed business and so on. And there's a new group of Africans which are quite progressive in the way that they think. So these are just a few of the factors that make... Africa uh, an interesting uh, destination for money and is attracting a lot of world of global funds. And then I just put up one of the other graphs over here, which is the population Christmas tree, if you like. But really, at the bottom over there is the naught, and at the top is the very old people. And as you can see, this is Nigeria, which is the most populous country in the world, nearly 140 million people. And will soon, within the next couple of years, it will become bigger than South Africa within the sub-Saharan African context. The GDP will be bigger. It's a very young population. And on the right-hand side over there is the forecast of what the population is going to look like in 2050. And you can see it's still a very young population, but it's now moved into people that are earning money, people that are 
investors in their own right, people that own businesses, people that are contributing to the tax and to the economy. So demo demographics is on the side of the African countries. And if you compare that again to the same graphs that you would for, for say, the whole of Europe, including Russia, it's a very much thinner graph and an aging population. These are all factors that one needs to think of from a global perspective. You need to be able to see a long-term horizon. And I just feel when I've been listening to you today, and please don't, it's only what I've heard today, it's not as if I know very much about these countries, I think of very attractive investment opportunities that are outside the CE at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. You very clearly explained why Africa is not Europe. It's a fast-growing region in terms of investment. I several times took advice from experts why is so much interest toward Africa and drew a parallel with Russia. More investment into Africa is into extraction, mineral extraction, gold mining, oil production that the African continent is rich in. In Russia, a large share of FDI is mineral extraction. And there was once uh, one summary that Russia and Africa in the future will uh, fight for investment. Today, European investment, investment in Europe is investment to human capital, despite some uh, demographic challenges that Europe is facing. So it's kind of investment of a different kind. Alexander, you wanted to add something? Some bias toward the power sector infrastructure in this discussion must explain. It's a kind of a special area for investment, which to a great extent depend on the government, on the regulatory environment framework. And in my presentation, I was speaking about the investment attractiveness of the regions of Russia, irrespective of uh, specific uh, areas for investment and fields. Infrastructure, uh, electric power supply, uh, water supply, these are future stars in terms of attraction of investment into Russia. Certainly, we should uh, have a clean-up operation and sort out problems, and there will uh, be a decision on long-term tariffs, which will uh, draw qualified investments leading uh, Western and Russian companies. Uh, will uh, safely invest their money and will have a guaranteed return. Uh, we do have uh, a lot of areas attractive for investments and where they do not depend as much on the government position. This is a FMCG sector which is underinvested, fast moving goods, consumer goods, and uh, it's agriculture, which we undervalue, and the regions which uh, are focusing on agriculture, they uh, say that there's a boom in agriculture there, which is not mm, widely known. Uh, quite, quite a lot of investment. Uh, I remember talking to uh, the governor from the Tambov region, he says that every year and the Tambov region, which is not a, the largest region, gets 70 to 80 billion rubles uh, investment into agriculture, which is quite an impressive figure. The country is quite attractive, uh, having this uh, large domestic market uh, in the, the people. With all the criticism that uh, is being uh, raised against and about the Russian education system, it is perhaps early to draw parallels with Africa. Still, we have uh, high-quality human capital, and investors recognize that. We will not and should not compete with China in terms of uh, uh, assembly of consumer goods, but a more high-tech area with the right government policy a pro-investor policy of the government can create investment boom in Russia 
And I do sincerely believe in that. We are now discussing issues and problems that our overseas colleagues may not fully understand. Why cannot Russia have long-term tariffs, uh, things that have been done in sea countries uh, long ago. And uh, it would seem to me that uh, when these problems are made less acute, uh, administrative hurdles mm, going down, more transparency, uh, we can, uh, uh, can quickly catch up in terms of investment into areas which we are not discussing. Uh, uh, as much as we should. S agriculture, infrastructure, and consumer goods. But you got to agriculture and a few other sectors uh, which were afraid of uh, WTO accession. This uh, first year of our um, being with WTO, uh, what, what is the uh, uh, initial result? More investment, less investment? I think investment is a kind of conservative. Uh, area and uh, sphere. It is too early and premature to speak and assess uh, on this uh, accession to WTO. Uh, we do not see uh, clearly any uh, negative uh, outcomes and effects. Another question. How do you calculate uh, inflow or outflow of foreign direct investment? How do you know? Uh, how do you calculate that? Uh, just before this uh, panel, we were talking about the numbers that uh, are publicly known about uh, the inflow of uh, foreign investment. Uh, $15 billion, uh, $30 billion. It's uh, difficult uh, to calculate. Uh, are there any methods uh, for calculation uh, of direct investment. Uh, maybe you can tell us what the experience uh, in this has been uh, in Central Europe. How does one calculate uh, foreign direct investment? Uh, since, since what moment uh, do we start uh, counting? Uh, when the contract is signed, our uh, method is uh, to look at investment uh, when the deal is closed and the money arrives into the country, when the money is being paid. Uh, to the seller. Uh, that's how we calculate uh, if we uh, look at methods used by different countries. People are usually looking at uh, the following things. Uh, in privatization, there's investment uh, obligations uh, section. Uh, we talked about it uh, when we uh, were discussing the energy sector in Russia. Uh, is this uh, methodology OK with you, Alexander? Uh, are you satisfied with this approach? Well, it's uh, one thing uh, what methodology investment banks are using, and uh, it's a different story what the state is using. Uh, we stick to the formal statistics, and uh, uh, those numbers are quite conservative. Uh, from what I know, they calculate the investment uh, that uh, where the projects are already working. There's uh, direct investment projects uh, where uh, facilities have already been put uh, into operation. So uh, we're looking at a uh, significant time lag uh, between the uh, moment when uh, money is invested and uh, when the company uh, goes to work. Uh, so we're looking at three to four years. Uh, we need uh, quick uh, updates about uh, the projects that are implemented in different uh, regions. Some companies are doing that, but uh, we uh, really uh, don't have uh, up-to-date uh, information that would be coming in real time. Uh, is it important? Uh, yes, it is important. Uh, we need to uh, see the exact uh, temperature um, in this uh, process. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from the participants, from guests, from the audience? We have about 20 minutes left, so we have an opportunity to uh, ask questions. I would like to say thank you uh, to the representative of South Africa. Uh, he had very clear charts 
and uh, everything was very clear. Small investments, quick return. That was a very uh, simple, very clear uh, principle. Uh, we in Russia have much to learn uh, from South Africa. I know uh, many business people who uh, are involved in investing in South Africa. Many of them have tried to use this experience uh, in Russia, but it hasn't worked very well. I have two questions. One about the uh, energy generation presentation. Uh, it was said that there is not enough democracy uh, in the process. I, I don't understand that. Uh, in energy generation, there were a lot of uh, small companies, uh, small businesses. Uh, that uh, was especially the case uh, under Mr. Chubais. Uh, the second question I have uh, has to do with the uh, business processes slow down. I understand why this is happening in uh, real estate. Uh, segment uh, when housing becomes affordable uh, businesses go into this uh, sector and then prices uh, begin to climb uh, we see similar things uh, going on in russia look at moscow look at uh, the moscow region look at the far east uh, of russia uh, the GDP of a country uh, does not necessarily mean uh, that uh, people begin to live better. Uh, and uh, again, I have a question about democracy. Why we're talking about democracy? Uh, or I, I don't understand uh, the link uh, between economic processes and uh, democracy. Uh, small uh, businesses have been uh, well uh, developed. Uh, they have been established. Uh, under Mr. Chubais, that's fine. Uh, human capital, uh, that's another question uh, that I wanted to ask. Uh, have you uh, looked at the purchasing power of the people in Russia and in Central and Eastern Europe? OK, uh, democracy wise, I think this was a question uh, for me. Uh, what were we talking about? what I meant. I was saying that uh, we do not see clear rules of the game uh, in uh, power utilities, in energy generation. Rules may change uh, in the middle of the game, and that is not appropriate. Uh, investors, including foreign investors, are not happy about that uh, when they are told that we are going to have uh, this number, then they review this number, review the rules, uh, then they say that they want to limit tariffs uh, growth, then they say that uh, they uh, did not get it right the first time, and uh, they are going to calculate the taxable base in a different way. I think for uh, a potential foreign investor, this uh, sounds quite uh, ugly. So what would a potential investor do? Uh, a potential investor would invest somewhere else, uh, in a different sector, in a different country. I think that uh, all those things are interrelated, and uh, as long as we don't have good order at the top, we are not going to see uh, anything good happening at the bottom. When we uh, look at uh, individual small businesses, I don't want to argue with you. Maybe they're feeling great uh, in this industry, but when we're looking at uh, big companies, uh, look at uh, their market capitalization, and uh, that will be a good illustration uh, on the thoughts that foreign investors have about the level of development in this industry. Is that an answer to your question? Well, this uh, is not. Uh, this has nothing to do with democracy. This uh, is about uh, the uh, level of low obedience. Uh, have you looked at uh, how many people buy uh, shares in Russia compared to the uh, same number in Central and Eastern Europe? Uh, what kind of capitalism uh, are we looking to buy? Uh, if we are talking about the development of human capital, then people have to participate uh, in market activities. I still, I'm still not getting the question. I'm sorry. 
uh, the Russian market, we have uh, publicly traded companies uh, that have a uh, capitalization of 17 uh, trillion people. Uh, one quarter of it is free float. Uh, anyone can uh, come and buy. And uh, people's purchasing power, um, I think we're having a misunderstanding about the uh, notion of uh, human capital and investment in human capital. I think we are talking about something else. I think we've been talking about investments uh, in uh, people's uh, training, in people's education. Uh, there are quite a few industries which require high level of training uh, for personnel which uh, works there. So we uh, looked at uh, our level of education, which still is quite a bit higher uh, than, for example, what we see in Africa. Do we have other questions? I am with the 2020 newspaper. I have a question for Verpath company. Marina, I understand what you do not like. Uh, I want to ask you what is out there that you like. Uh, your uh, co-panelists have uh, spoke about agriculture. Uh, in your company, do you like agriculture? Uh, what do you personally think about agriculture as a sector? And uh, another question, and you may take them in any sequence, whatever is uh, more comfortable. Uh, we had an interesting presentation on Africa. Uh, certainly regional division uh, is uh, not an absolute thing. Uh, there's uh, good prospects uh, that we see in Africa. But how competitive is Africa against Latin America? We've compared uh, Europe to Africa. Can we compare Africa to Latin America? Let's, uh, Do we like agriculture? What do we like? Uh, power generation? Uh, despite all the negative things, despite all uh, the problems, we uh, see that this uh, sector has good potential. Uh, valuations are low, so we still like this sector. As of agriculture, our funds uh, historically have been focusing on public companies. And there's not so many of them in Russia working in the field of agriculture. Uh, I cannot say that we are very fond of them. There's been some uh, that were not bad. Uh, there's been uh, several investments in Ukrainian agricultural businesses. Uh, they were public uh, companies. As of uh, private equity investment, uh, there was a big project in Arkhangelsk area. We exited it uh, with some uh, minor profit, but this was uh, still viewed as a successful exit because it happened during the crisis. Uh, we had another successful project in Kaliningrad region in 2006-2007. Uh, we also had uh, quite a bit of success there, but those were not very big projects. Mr. Thompson, over to you. Um, I'd just like to say that I think this region's got such enormous potential, and it's got the potential because of that human capital that you've mentioned so many times. You've just got to create the environment for investors. It'll be private equity investors, fixed investors into plants and so on, and also for stock market investors. And I'm sure you have the potential to do that. It's hard to compare even Africa to Africa sometimes because it's such a vastly different place. So to compare Africa to Latin America would be even more difficult over there. I think those countries are individual and they need to be looked at in an individual way. But Africa has the potential with that growing population, which unfortunately, because there are so many different countries, it's not all gonna grow at the same time and it's not gonna grow at the same rate, but has the potential to be the next China over this next uh, the, the century that we've got. And that is where, uh, why it is attracting a lot of investment long-term investment. When you think about a mining company, they are doing years of exploration, then it's going to take years of development, and then finally they're going to start getting a cash flow maybe 10, 15 years down the way, and they've got to have the security of 10 years before they can plan. 
and certainly in some countries you don't have that security of tenure or else the regime changes. But nevertheless, there are enough countries, enough investors out there that are making Africa change at the moment. Thank you. I have a question for uh, Katarina Kohlmeier. Uh, we had a very interesting presentation on Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I am sorry that you have not uh, mentioned my country, Ukraine. I wonder why. Uh, I know that VDB Capital is quite active uh, in issues of uh, Eurobonds in m and activities. Could you comment on that? The reason is very simple. Uh, Ukraine is not my specialty. It is a, a special business for VTB. Uh, it is a big piece of business. We have a bank in Ukraine and we work in uh, many spheres of business there. So I decided uh, to not uh, talk about Ukraine because I'm not an expert. There are two uh, big regions, uh, the former Soviet Union and the former Eastern Europe. Uh, there are very good links between Ukraine and Poland, uh, even better ties uh, than uh, Poland has with Russia. There's good ties with Slovakia. Uh, there's quite a bit of activity. But uh, as of today, there's a lack of capital in Ukraine. We know that in Russia there are quite a few uh, companies with very uh, high level of capitalization. They have greater access uh, to European markets. I am sure that uh, there will be uh, more uh, going on between uh, Ukraine and Central and Eastern Europe. Um, Anton Spuntov, uh, I have been a panelist uh, this morning. Uh, you mentioned uh, three uh, sectors, uh, power generation, uh, power utilities, and uh, agriculture. Uh, there is uh, a notion that uh, these uh, sectors are not well developed. Uh, do you have an idea what kind of investment uh, would be needed uh, to bring uh, these uh, sectors of economy to proper level of development? I can tell you uh, about uh, city utilities uh, to uh, bring uh, heating systems uh, to good state. Uh, you would have to uh, invest about uh, one uh, year turnover amount. Uh, the uh, state of uh, networks in uh, St. Petersburg uh, has been uh, very poor. Moscow has been uh, much better. Uh, the turnover of the entire uh, city utilities is uh, equal to uh, $2 trillion. Uh, so that is the order of magnitude uh, we're looking at. Uh, there's uh, been this uh, program for attracting investment uh, to city utilities. Uh, there were some numbers there. Uh, if we sum up those numbers, uh, that is about the uh, level that we get in total. Uh, it's comparable to the uh, yearly turnover. Uh, in energy generation, I think we have overcapacity these days. If you uh, talk to people who work in this sector uh, to attract uh, more investment, they use a greater uh, development uh, rate uh, than was needed, and uh, with the new entries, uh, we are really looking at overcapacity. Uh, there's really uh, not uh, much uh, need uh, uh, to invest in power generation, uh, just replacing uh, some older aging facilities. Uh, Two trillion dollars. Uh, wow, uh, that's. Are we talking about dollars or rubles? I think it was dollars, uh, but that is a number for all of Russia. Uh, that is uh, similar to uh, all of Russia's uh, GDP. Uh, I, I could be wrong about the currency. Uh, uh, huge. Uh, 
amazing number, uh, 2.7 trillion rubles, uh, that was the correct number. Uh, in uh, heating networks, uh, I heard uh, about the number of a trillion dollars. Uh, so that is what is theoretically needed uh, to bring them uh, to good shape. Well, it's not only about the availability of funds, uh, it's about proper disposition of funds. Although uh, we're talking about private investors, they know how to spend money. Well, there are different kinds of private investors. That is true. Uh, something about agriculture. It's uh, all in private hands. We looked at agricultural uh, businesses of different kinds, uh, poultry, pig farming, cattle farming, uh, there were some uh, very reasonable uh, subsidy programs uh, passed by the government. Uh, there's uh, been many changes uh, in this sector. In grain farming, uh, we are doing fine uh, the way I see it. Uh, in grain production, uh, I think yields are uh, way lower, but we are still uh, profitable. We are still an exporter. Uh, we have to bring this session to an end. Uh, there's uh, still time uh, to uh, discuss things during the reception. I think uh, we had a very interesting, a very challenging discussion. Central Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, and Russia are very different. Uh, different countries have different legislations. They have different needs and different objectives. Uh, all those who have uh, been with us today, I hope, uh, have had something interesting for themselves. Uh, this brings our session to the end. Thank you.